Coming to you from McCurdy's Comedy Theater in Sarasota, Florida, it's the Open Bar Comedy Show. On today's show, Elliot Freese, entrepreneur extraordinaire and almost a guest of the Tonight Show, catches Open Bar Comedy Special, Dry Age, and Del Marble. Here's your host, Ron Feingold. Hey everyone, this is Ron Feingold with Open Bar Comedy. This is the Open Bar Comedy Show. Today's episode we have from Kansas City, Elliot Threat, somebody that I met a long time ago, I would say over 25 years ago. At least ago. 25 years yeah. ago. In Kansas City, uh, there's a club in Kansas City called Stanford and Sons. There was a yeah. club called Stanford and Sons, part it of is. our lore. It's just a memory now. And there was a, an owner there that I would say was like the personality of the place, wouldn't you say? Craig Glazer. Exactly. And, and his uh, brother, what's his brother's name? Uh, Craig, Jeff, and Jack. There are three of them. Okay, so you knew those guys a lot better than I did. I only worked I there uh, one weekend. And I just remember him taking me out to um, radio shows and making me tell lies about my credits. He's like, yeah, tell him that you were on HBO Showtime. And, you know, did he make you do that kind of stuff? Yes, he did. I mean, he, he exaggerated, but at some point you felt good because it was almost aspirational. It's like, oh, my God, <laughs> if I do everything he says, I'm going to be famous, right? <laughs> yeah, I have to do this now. Exactly. Make it true. He did The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Well, I can't do that, but hey, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, he was great about that. Did you work the Westport Room? Most I worked. That's where I started the Westport Room, actually. How long ago was that? 1980. Oh my God. I am old head. I'm an old head. Is That's that what 43 years. 43 years ago. I'm only 33 years in. Yeah. I, you're, you're the old guy now. I'm the old guy. Well, I started, I performed right after I graduated from high school. I mean, if I was famous, it'd be a great sitcom because I went straight from my graduation, took the robe off in the car, went up and did my first stand up act. Really? And that was at Westport's? That was at Westport. And you were how old? 18. 18 years 18 old. 18 years old. Right out of high school. Right, literally right out of high school. And the plan was to be a comic or was somebody forcing you to go into college? I went to college anyway because I had a tennis scholarship, but I could do both at the same time. But the thing about that is, is that uh, at then, Robin Williams was the height of Mork and Mindy, the height of Aykroyd and Belushi on SNL. So people were always looking for a way to do comedy. And this, all these comedy clubs sprouted up all over the world. It was the boom of the 80s. The boom of the 80s. Yeah. Much easier now than it is, much easier then than it was now. Right. What would you say? There were probably about 1,500, 2,000 working comics at that time. Yes. You know? Yeah. Wouldn't you say that's a pretty good number? I, I'd estimate. say that's a pretty good number. You know? Um, and so you were doing this, say, I came in in 1990, so uh -huh. I was 10 years later. Where at? And uh, that was in Colorado Springs, okay. and that was Jeff Valdez's Comedy Corner. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you ever work that club for Jeff Valdez? Yeah. And I when love it was that Jeff club. Valdez, yeah. and Judy Brown was there, yeah. and um, started there, and uh, but I was still in college at the time, so mm -hmm. I was just getting sets whenever I could, and then I graduated from college, though. So you had. Uh, uh, much, much more bigger balls to do so it So did you earlier. actually go up to Denver or are you just a Springs boy? Yeah, I started doing the Denver stuff, the comedy work stuff where Roseanne started. I started going up to Wits End. Uh, did you ever do Wits End with yes, John Cooney? I did that. You know, the weird thing about it is is that when you were from Kansas City, Denver, or Minneapolis, we were kind of on a, I mean, we're far away, but we're kind of an island, but we kind of sent you know, troops or, or, or pioneers or scouts out there. So uh, Roseanne would come to Kansas City and Sinbad and everybody would go to Minneapolis or the Springs or Louis Anderson would come down from Minneapolis and Cesario and all those guys. So we kind of had that little thing, our little uh, comedy triangle there. Were you working with those guys? Mm -hmm. Were you uh, headlining at the time or were you opening for those names? That oh, you my gosh. Well, for Louis, I was kind of... Uh, well, we kind of started off when we were all kind of, there wasn't even a headliner, so to speak. It was just kind of all comics grouped together. But uh, eventually started uh, featuring for Louis, featuring for Roseanne, uh, featuring for Sinbad. So, yeah, all those stuff. What would you say was the, the biggest struggle at that time? Like, did you have any struggle? I, I mean, it was easier to get on stage, like you said. But uh, what would you say was your struggle? It was easier to get on stage because back then, if you just went out to the comedy store and looked at it and came back to the Midwest and said, hey, I'm at the comedy store, it's like, fine, where do you want a week, right? And it paid more. I mean, I look at my old, you ever look at your date books from 30 years ago and look at the pay and say, nothing's changed? Nothing's changed nothing's at all. Nothing's changed. 200, 200 headline. 200 headline, 100 to feature, right? <laughs> Nothing's changed. That's right. I mean, I got, we were paying really well back then, right? If you think about it. Oh, back yeah, in, the, right. the job, I mean, I'd have to work all day to get like yeah. half of this. But, you know, we're bitching about doing a 45 minute for 
two hundred bucks, but still, it's the time that it takes to get out to these things. And well, the thing is, it's like movies. They say they, uh, you get paid for trying to get the movies. You do the movies for free, and a lot of times the travel mm -hmm. is the the hard part, right? That's what you get paid for the travel, and it the is. travel is just. It wasn't always it. How many times have you been, uh, you know, changing your clothes in a gas station before a show? That sort of thing, you know. And yeah. it was a really weird dichotomy because you could be the star of this little VFW horror comedy club and everybody loves you. And then smash cut, you're at a gas station. Nobody knows who you are in sweatpants heading back to where you're ever at. Yeah, right? it's an awful feeling. It's like <laughs> just such a buzzkill to go back to a hotel room after having know, all the adrenaline nothing, and love. And, nothing. and then just silence and just yeah. like, man, I wish, mm -hmm. I wish we could just buzz around and talk about how wonderful I am for just about five more no. minutes. No, that's um, why you soak it in when you're there. Yeah, exactly. Back to Westport. I remember uh, one of the first times that I worked there, I was parking in the parking lot across the street from there, and parking was very limited. Limited? Yeah. So I was uh, waiting for a spot there, and uh, I sneaked in as this guy pulled out, sneak, snuck into the spot, and this guy is right there in his car going, what the fuck, man? Are you serious? Yeah. And it's David Nasty. Oh, my God. The comic that I'm working with that night. Oh, my God. So he's busy. <laughs> I'm like, hey, hey. I didn't see you waiting there, man. I backed out my car. Oh, my God. That's go very nice in. of you. I didn't want any shit with How anybody. How Colorado nice of you to Thank do you that. very much. So he goes into the space and everything. I go find a space. And, and, and we met in the parking lot. He's like, man, I didn't mean to scare the shit. I'm like, yeah, you scared the shit out of me. Oh, my man. God. It's your parking spot. You're the headliner. You take it. But I didn't I didn't mean anything by it, you know. But well, that's a tell that he, he, he shouldn't act that way to begin with. with somebody, <laughs> you know. True. But he's a legend in uh, Kansas City. He's a legend City. in Kansas City. He, he kind of got everybody started in Kansas City he, uh, from those very like the Godfather, corners. right? Yeah. Every town has that person, mm -hmm. right? Every That's right. I don't know who that was in Denver. Ed Nichols, maybe? In Denver, it was more like Tim Testa was in charge of the uh, open mic night, mm -hmm. if you remember him. But there were guys like Matt Woods, Matt Berry. Um, those guys went out and, and worked for Roseanne uh, later on and, yeah. and were writers. But... Um, you know, the Troy Baxleys, you know, they were, uh, I wouldn't call myself the grandfather. I was more like Colorado Springs guy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, we also have a, a common friend uh, by the name of Johnny Olvang. John Olvang, yeah, very good who common friend. I want to give props to right now. I'm, I don't get a chance to talk about this much, but I, he gave me permission mm -hmm. to record his song, Yodel in the Canyon. Hilarious. Uh, on my uh, I love your CD. rendition of that, uh, well, too, thank by you. the way. I appreciate it. And I usually uh, do it in, in most nights of my show. I owe Johnny some money. i got to get him a check. No. And um, You know, so, John Olvang was a very funny guy. In comedy, people kind of, uh, especially over the swath of 30 years or so, people yeah. kind of drift in for five or six years and then drift out, right? And they drift in. And, and John drifted in for about 10 years and, and uh, made a lot of friends, super nice. I went everywhere with him. We would do these... Rapid City, South Dakota, Sioux mm -hmm. City, Omaha, every place. And then I guess just at a point you have to say, am I going to stick with this or am I going to go to something else? And it's always kind of a, it's almost like gambling, right? Am I going to stay at the casino or am I going to get out, you know? So yeah. so he got out. Yeah. And But is he still dabbling or is he not doing still, it at all? No, he's still very funny and yeah. he still plays the guitar. He lives back in Kansas City. I mm -hmm. think you turned watching. He lives back in Kansas City with his son, Jack. And uh, he found another gig, but he still plays every once in a while. I can persuade him to get out there, you know. But the thing he still has all the talent, but what he's kind of gone back to now is uh, kind of the solo guitarist, you know what I mean? I think, that's, I think that's a good fallback when you're a guitar comic. You can go back to the solo guitarist and just kind of do your guitar thing and insert comedy as you feel necessary, right? Yeah. He's great. Yeah. You, know, you and I have uh, the same entrepreneurial gene, so to speak. You are a hustler, man. Uh, well, you're no. a flat out hustler. I love it. But you're the OG, man. Oh. You're the OG. <laughs> we were we were somewhere. Where the hell were we, man? We were somewhere. I want to say we were in uh, we were at the Skyline or something yeah. uh, in Appleton, I want to yeah. say. And uh, in the condo and uh, all day, I'm like, hey, Ellie, you want to go get it? No, nah, man, I got all this work to do. You were a computer guy. You were a briefcase with papers. And, oh, I and, do remember and, the briefcase. Oh, oh the, my God. I, yeah, you I remember that? Remember it was that. packed with papers and yes, shit. Yes, I do remember and, that. Uh, this guy, folks, this guy had uh, uh, I, I, airport, I, airport kiosk. G I started off uh, with GNC stores. I actually, I started off with a maid service because I kind of made this decision to myself. I said, I don't mind if I'm not famous. I just want to work for myself. Yeah. Common thing, right? And actually, probably because they asked, would you rather be famous or rich? I think rich would be the thing because fame, you know, 
with cell Fleeting. phones. There's no privacy, and and right. yeah, after your money runs out, you still are, are hounded and everything like that. But anyway, I was always hustling in business and uh, started off with the uh, GNC stores. I the cruise ships took all that money, bought a GNC store. Doesn't seem possible now, but yes, I did. <laughs> I did have those, and then I. Uh, can I, I ask how much that was? Oh, uh, sure, sure you can. It was a uh, well. Here's the thing. It was about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to open up a gym for the franchise. Fee. Yes, but here's the key. What I did is that uh, I found a mall that wanted a GNC store in Salina, Kansas, and the mall said, "I'll give you fifty thousand if you open up here." No kid. So then I went to the bank and said to the bank, "Hey, I got fifty grand," and they did it. So I kind of did that. Uh, no money down things. So did I, you pay that loan off eventually with the GNC store? Yeah, well, I paid it off. I kind of expanded. I went from one in Lawrence to, I mean, Salina to Lawrence to about five or six in Kansas City, and then I had a little GNC Empire. And then I sold it, and then I got into the airport business, airport concessions. You know, yeah. So if you overpay too much for a hot dog or forty dollars <laughs> for a beer, That's you're helping me. You're helping me. <laughs> you're. You're helping me uh, have the finer things. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know I've gotten a lot of your money, too. Oh, yeah. you have. Thank you. You have. <laughs> I have burped a lot of your food. I'm still <laughs> tasting it. Um, but so you went, uh, those were just Kansas City airports or all over? No, I started off in the Kansas City airport, and now I'm also in uh, the Minneapolis airport, Madison, Wisconsin, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, St. Louis, Missouri, Salt Lake City. Dallas, Texas, Orange County. I think that's Don't it. call me a hustler when you just mention all those places and locations. <laughs> you are the OG. That's amazing. I love it. That's a beautiful thing, man. And, and just to see comics that have another hustle going. We have a uh, – people have a mindset about comics that we're dumb, that uh, we can only do this, like we can only do stand-up comedy. But people don't see the multifaceted Well, here's things. the thing about that is that being able to communicate, because I didn't get these. These deals with airports and cities, and you have to make presentations. Yeah. So we get to the big presentation. I look over at all the Harvard MBAs and they're, they're face down to their note cards. And it's like, I've been talking, I've been making eye contact with people for 30 years. I got this. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what it boils down to, connecting with people. You know what I mean? And if you can connect with folks. So the thing is you can connect with people because that's what comedians do is they connect with people on a personal level and they listen very well. You know what I mean? So basically, when they would do the presentation, I go, oh, okay, this guy is from this place. I remember this about that place and this and that and, you know, and made that connection. And now I have all those places and it's fun. And what it allows me to do now, which is the best of all worlds, I get to do comedy for fun and enjoy it more than anything. I mean, some yeah. people do comedy. Some people, I mean, some people go fishing. Some people, I do comedy. Because the worst thing, this is why we're all these, you know, these other side of, is doing comedy to have to do it because you're really, I mean, remember just, I mean, we're taping this in December now. Remember in December where you just, it's like, oh my God, I've got all this week. This is my money week, right? It and, is. And, and, I'm holding these first two weeks for yeah, my corporate yeah. show. That's exactly it. But <laughs> if it doesn't happen, you're screwed. It, it never happened after 2001. Yeah. And then you're realizing you're booking stuff so far in advance back out in the day. It's like, what if I hit it big. Why am I settling for $400 to feature three years from now? But the thing is, it's the security of having something out there, right? And you just have to have one anchor week somewhere out there in March and then and then try to build around it, yeah. you know? As open bar grows, I hope to understand what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> it um, is growing. Well, the great thing about what you've done is, is that you saw a niche there. And those other people who I won't mention have a very... Uh, it's a tight niche. Uh, t a tight niche, a very... Uh, <laughs> it's a specified, narrow a niche. A specified, narrow niche of, uh, of white religious folks. <laughs> <they like. laughs> right. And, uh, and not everybody else. But the point is, is that you get everybody. And I like the way you're kind of going back. I, I'm, I'm so flattered that you called me. I like the way that you're kind of going back and just kind of giving all these people who are legends, Jeff Chen, or Larry Reeb, Rich a Scheidner. shot, yeah. Rich Scheidner, you know what I yeah. mean? Uh, Felicia Michaels, these yeah. people who were around. We've contacted the unknown comic. We're close to getting Murray Langston. Murray Langston to, oh my to God. get a Ask special. him how it was like being with Deborah Winger. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we you are... go from the governor of Nebraska, no, from unknown comic to the governor of Nebraska, Bob Carey, you know right. what I mean? It's, uh, 
it's something that I wanted to create a legacy for a lot of guys that wouldn't fit other formats and also didn't have the opportunity to do specials elsewhere. I mean, there's some legends that have crisscrossed this country. Headliners, great acts that people never heard. One thing that's happening, and I'm putting this out now, and hopefully by the time this airs, it'll be a done deal. Matt Berry, who I mentioned earlier. Yes. Is I, I go on Facebook and I see a picture of him on the flapper stage in Burbank and uh, he's trying stuff out again. So, and it's been like 35 years since he's, I don't know how long, I would venture a guess 30 years at least uh, that he has been on stage. So I wrote him like, we need to talk, buddy. So I am in talks hopefully with Matt Berry about That'd doing a great. special to get him back. He's one of the funniest human beings I've ever met on the planet. Well, that's where they all come back. You know, people say, well, when are you going to stop doing comedy? It's like, well, hold on. Jerry Seinfeld's worth a billion dollars and he's in Topeka next week. Right. right? So you have to realize it's not about the money. It's about what it does for the comics, you know what I mean? And yeah. we talked about that. You think about all the people, how lucky you are, how lucky I am that our job doesn't involve, and there's nothing matter with working in cubicles and everything like that, but our job involves connection with people. And when you think about over the course of your 33 years, how many people you made laugh, how many people you made happy in those 33 years, how many people you touched at a bad day or whatever, and you can't quantify that, yeah. but you know it's there. I didn't touch as many people. You didn't touch as many people. You know what I'm saying. That's Cosby and Vince Chan. You know what I'm saying. (laughs) Don't touch people. We found it out all. Um, So, yeah, we've pumped out a lot of positivity is what Mm -hmm. I'm saying into the world. It feels good. I mean, to reflect back on it and to say I probably saved some lives or, you know, you love it when somebody comes up to you after a show and says, I had the shittiest week. Um, it was the worst fucking day that I've had, and coming to this show made me forget all about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How about this? When you find somebody, because I was doing a show last week in Kansas City, and they said, I saw you at this place 25 years ago, and they remembered. And you know yes. how much is gone. Yes. It was nothing to you, but that they remember this capsule. Time. They remember this bit that you did 25 yeah. years ago. Yeah. They saved that. Yes. That entire time and brought it up. It was in their memory banks. It's long gone for you. But that's how important it was mm-hmm. when you made that connection with them, that they saved that little tidbit, that little moment in time, and then brought it back to you. I love that. I just had that happen a while ago. It was the World Series of Comedy, and mm-hmm. somebody had seen me at Summerfest like 25 years ago. And he's like, oh, I remember you on the Somerset Fest stage, and uh, Louis Black was the headliner, and you came out and did your thing. I'm like, man, I forgot all about that. That's yeah. amazing. I love that. Isn't show. that weird when that happens? Love it. it feels so great. What before you had your companies? Then did you have like an ultimate comedy goal that uh, was? It you know, sitcoms? my comedy goal was to uh, get on the uh, Tonight Show. That was everybody's comedy goal, right? To get on the Tonight Show and, and see what happens. Although. I think things happen for a reason because uh, I always say if I was famous when I wanted to be, I would have been a has-been by now, right? There's something <laughs> about that slow, <laughs> Isavis type pushing the ball up the mountain here yeah. that about it. But I don't know how that works there because I'm in a really happy place now because all the businesses, right? Because you just can't count on comedy, you know, nowadays unless you're – you're super famous, you know what I mean? That doesn't mean you're not funny. I said there's a difference. You're just as funny as the super famous people. And that's the thing about comedy. How many times have you sat on, watched somebody on TV, and it's like, well, how'd this person get on? What, you know? Yeah. yeah. There's been a lot of YouTubers I've thought that about that are filling up theaters, you know? I mean, there's YouTubers that are passing themselves off as comedians. Yes. And then they're filling up theaters, and yeah. people are walking away from a lot of those times. Not always. I don't want to generalize. But walking away from those shows going, that was kind of a lacking show. Yeah. You know, that they didn't a, know. There, there, wasn't, was, there, was, there wasn't a history behind it, right? Yeah, or but, this I guy mean, is not just, a comedian. Yeah. Well, it's like crack cocaine. They, they get that big high, and then it's gone. And then they... They have five minutes because that's the use people are seeing, and then what you have to go the long haul, that's what they can't do, right? The crack cocaine analogy yeah. always works. Yeah, because we do a crack. I mean, <laughs> that's how we met. Here's my dealer. Thank you, by the way. I still owe you. Shout for that out rock. to Whitney. <laughs> so um, let's see. A little bit of rapid fire questions. Sure. Uh, let me ask you that. Um, uh, what's your sleep number? My sleep number is 11. It doesn't go that high. 
No, I have a Spinal Tap bed. Of course it goes to 11. Oh, Spinal Tap bed. What is that? <laughs> did you ever see the movie Spinal Tap? I did, but I don't know what a Spinal Tap. I don't remember. You get it. Or it's like we have a speaker. Yours goes to 11. Oh, I oh, got I you. Oh, I don't understand. I got you. I'm you going turn obscure. Turn it up to 11. I'm, I'm, that was obscure. <laughs> yeah. Shit, I can be an obscure. I thought you would catch that. <laughs> I do now. I'm slow. I'm You're sorry. You're a musical comic, and I'm you sorry. didn't catch the Spinal sorry. Tap to 11 reference. I really t- Take his license. <laughs> Take his license. It goes to 11. I should leave. I That's should right. not be in this job anymore the I'm other sorry. one is uh what 220 221 whatever it takes which is the mr mom uh michael keaton reference with martin mall so those are the two number references up to 11 220 221 whatever turn my bed up to 11 <laughs> yeah right well on. i don't understand 10's higher but you see 11 gives much more softness <laughs> that, okay uh you ever been jealous of another man's peace stream uh let me think you know, I don't really look that much, but... Uh, no, it's a listening thing, like in the bathroom, like you hear like a young guy oh, walking in. Oh, stream. Stream. What did you think I said? Oh, I thought you said string. <laughs> no, I'm always jealous of the guy's peace. I mean, just the power in the force. Yes, you know that's what, what I mean? I'm saying. I was in yeah. like a restroom the other day, and this young guy walks in. I'm in a stall, and this guy just like immediately... He's like a fire wham! hose. Yeah. 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 Just turned on the hose. Yeah, actually, good and I'm, clean toilet stains with that string. Y- yes. Yeah. It's like pressure washer, yeah. right? And and I'm just bubbling brook, bubbling brook, trying to start. You have to think <laughs> about stuff, you know. And then you know, I I, I sometimes have to put my hand, you know, get it in the whole the, uh, you know, blowjob in the car it. type thing. Yeah. The, oh yeah. Sorry. Right, let me do it then. I'm gonna name you Sally, Miss Urinal. There you go. <laughs> well, I bring that up. I have a urologist. I'm, I'm part of this study, and uh, it's called uh, Pro V, and um, I think it's what it's called, it's Pro V. But it's a stint that they're putting in. My, oh my God! Don't my, my dude down there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm already like three quarters into the way to this thing. But uh, are you uh, serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, they put a. Stint you want to? You got a stint in you now? Mm-hmm. Oh my God! Yeah, man. At least I was oh! told I did. I believe I do. There's a placebo in this study too, so I could be a placebo. I could be not, but it's. I I think is it's there, in there a placebo stint? That's a thing. There's a. It's totally. What they tell you to close your eyes and think about well, baseball. Here's, here's why I think that I don't have uh, the placebo. <laughs> Why I don't think I have <laughs> the, the placebo is because I go to the airport and uh, for the first time ever I go off in the thing yeah. and they go look at the screen and there's a dot right and point to oh my my god like, you got it right there so it's like we got to pat you down right here I forgot all about it and the guy I'm like pat me down here I don't care but can she do it <laughs> exactly but, but, so they pat me down we do all this and he's like you're free and clear to go and then a minute later I remember like oh yeah I remember I had the procedure done it was done. So I believe it's in there because the TSA kind of confirmed it. Why? I want to pee better. It's supposed to open up. I know, up but I mean, my... is, is that of all your problems? I mean, taking longer to pee, that's it what was free. gets you? It was free. Okay. It was free. So I'm part of the A lot of stuff free. that's painful is free. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want to have a, a tube shoved down your dick for free? <laughs> yeah. We'll give you drugs. I'm, I'm on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Well, at least you had enough dick to thread it, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. well, my pea string helped yeah. me out. Sometimes it's like sticking a uh, straw through a mini donut, right? You don't have a lot of slack you got to pull out there. It's metal. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's Dude. metal. Yeah, yeah. But Dude. I don't feel it. I don't feel it. All. I know you're, you're, it hurts right now. All the guys, you should see the crew right now. Yeah. Like, Brian, all right? He's like adjusting his shit. It's like, ugh. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk. Whenever we Thanks do, for sharing them. You're welcome. I don't, I've never met a guy. Who I've met, ended up know, in my underwear, you know. which I will in this episode yeah. too. In these things, let's talk about that. So okay. we always do. We always try to find some fun products that okay. we talk about in our vidcast okay. uh, for the Open Bar Comedy Show. And uh, one of the ones that we did in this past one was uh, we found a Richard Simmons Chia Pet head, and uh, we actually got to go and uh, we I can see, show I you. thought that was John C. Riley <laughs> from uh, Step Brothers, actually. <laughs> Yeah, and so... Um, Boats and hoes. Boats and hoes. <laughs> and it actually turned out really great. Oh, my so gosh. So we have this uh, a growth uh, uh, video that we have of the, the progression of, uh, of him growing as it goes along. It's pretty cool. Do like a little but, time-lapse thing? Yeah, we got okay. that. We'll, we'll show that right now. But, um, yeah, so Richard Simmons worked out. If you uh, click Why on the Simmons link... Simmons' mouth open in well, such a happy, his mouth inviting was always way. Like, Hello, everybody! Yeah! Okay. So... If you want a Richard Simmons Chia Pet head and try this out yourself, because it's really fun to grow. It was fun to watch this thing and uh, to watch it just kind of grow out. We're going to snip this off and give it a haircut and see what happens. So that's the next step we're going to do. But if you want to get a Richard Simmons Chia Pet head, click on the link below, and uh, this link will take you right to get your own Richard Simmons Chia Pet head. 
Also, whenever we do these things, we've been messing around with ball hammock underwear. Have you ball seen? Ball hammock. Have you I've seen? I've heard of ball hammock. Yeah. And what I've also found out is uh, we have done three companies so far. We have done the um, uh, um, the jockey company, mm -hmm. the all citizens company, mm -hmm. and a company called Sax. Mm -hmm. S A X X Sax. And uh, so all citizens was one that really came close because they have this ball hammock thing that holds your boys. And, they, you know, you're from a humid state in yes. the summertime. And, you you know, sometimes your testicles will, will – will, and your sack will stick to your side of, of your leg. Of course it right? does. So the whole point of this kind of underwear is to separate your guys from your leg to keep them in its own little pouch. And that's the name of the company, Ball Hammock. Well, that's the trademark of the actual device, if you want to call mm -hmm. it that, or the little insert that's in the underwear. So Let's see. this is from the Shinesty company. Okay. Shinesty. Shinesty. And uh, what I love about them is they have amazing marketing. These people are really doing some great Facebook ads. It's probably popped, it's going to pop up even more in mine, but it has really breathable material. And uh -huh. that's what I'm looking for. This really kind of uh, sticks to you really good. But the great thing the about hammock? it is, is the hammock, the, the ball ha hammock. You know who they should have? They should have AI Skipper and AI Gilligan. Because they made hammocks famous. That's right. Did, did you even know what a hammock was before the skipper? skipper. Yeah, really. My balls are sticking to my So leg. imagine Skipper as a ball and Gilligan as a ball just drifting in their hammocks, right? Just maybe one uh, hammock hits them with the, what, the, the skipper hat. With there. the hat, right. Yeah. So um, I'm going to try these on at the end okay. of the episode. But the great thing I love about this company is I, I ordered these underwear, right? Uh -huh. sent me. The other thing is, is not only do uh, they have ball hammock in okay. their marketing, but they have actually uh, placed the word ball hammock on their marketing there to say they've actually trademarked it. They you trademarked know, ball they hammock? Trademarked the word ball hammock. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Trademarked. So I so, guess I should go out and trademark dick mackers, <laughs> right? So anyway, we got this. Uh, from the Shinesty Company. Oh my and, God, uh, that's hilarious! I'm gonna try this one out. Should I try this out right try now? It out. Give it a try shot. It out. Okay, so I'll be right back. You'll be right back. All right, let's see. Oh my God, look at these! It's a ball hammock. There you go. Look at that. There you go. And how are the boys? The boys are in there, and I can totally feel them separated and everything. And this is such breathable underwear. It feels like I, it feels like I don't have anything on, really. Mm -hmm. But you know. Ugh. I had to kind of, since I'm kind of hanging. Now, did you, have to put, did you have to put the boys in the hammock? I did. I okay. was just going to say that. That's okay. good because it didn't just slide up into that. Uh -huh. I kind of had to place them uh -huh. into the proper form uh -huh. and let everything kind of uh -huh. fall into place. So you know who probably hates this idea of the ball hammock? Big baby powder. Big baby powder. Tell me about that. What is well, that? Well, because, you know, that's if you oh, don't have baby ball powder hammocks. People, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, you don't want to get that shit. Yeah. You don't want to get yeah. that shit. Yeah. Because the baby powder, the only thing is that, that that wears off and it gets on all your clothes. The ball hammock, my friend. This is such a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wear these the rest of the day for all of our filmings uh -huh. and let you know how it goes and we'll report it on the next one. Uh -huh. But they feel really great. The, the thing that's different from the other ones is they were, um, you know, not very breathable. The other thing that I want to mention is, is that they have like a dick enhancing feature to it. The underwear has like it's kind of like a little bulge enhancer uh -huh. in the front of it so i'm not going to show it to you but uh -huh. i feel it right there you feel like yeah. you're bigger i feel a little bigger uh, yeah yeah so, good. yeah so that'll show through jeans and everything i'm gonna put my pants back all on. right good i just put my pants back on that's right and i feel like lifted and supported like it's a lift well, up it didn't bra. make you look good i mean between the hammock and the stent you really have a lot going on down there you know <laughs> but it, it leads me to believe that uh it's easier access for the TSA once they get at the stent. The fact that you have it in a hammock, they're like, just out there, yeah, right? They're like that right. bulge wasn't. They what don't we have to deal was. with any inner thigh with you, right? <laughs> they can just go straight to the hammock, right? <laughs> it's true. Like just, like a speed bag and Rocky. Right? <laughs> and I'm, I hope I didn't scare you with um, coming out in my underwear. Of course not. We're, we're of course men. Not. Of course we not. Of course not. Really. So, it's been a lot of locker rooms. So I know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, tell me about your children. I have three children. Actually, I have a son who is uh, 30 who uh, works at Burberry. Very, you know, if you want to spend 800 bucks for a scarf, people do that. Then I have another son who is a karate instructor who lives his whole life by Cobra Kai. I don't know if you're no watching Cobra Kai. Yeah. He's, he's actually met all the uh, Cobra Kai people. You know, they come on those shows. So he's met Johnny Lawrence and Ralph Macchio and and all these other guys. He's got his car decorated as Cobra Kai. He's, he's a black belt, so he teaches that in boxing. And I have a daughter 
who actually is a uh, wants to get in the wardrobe business. So she's kind of a seamstress uh, studying that kind of stuff in college right now. So she's got a sewing machine, and you know she gets a gets a sewing machine and gets her headphone like you get in a zone or something. You know what I mean? Like you kind of get a you know. I'll take your word for it. I've yeah. never uh, put on the Beats by Dre and hit well, the I machine. May, maybe she will come out with the next ball hammock. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it, it, it is a sewing technique. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. but she's actually come up with some great. Uh, well, actually, she clothes. has got. She she put up something on Instagram. She came up with like a little Hello Kitty holder that got you know. So, kids find ways to monetize things that are so mm-hmm. different, and it's hard for me as a comedian, because uh, none of my kids have uh, college degrees yet. I don't think they will, but I don't think it's important because I. It's hard for me to say, hey. You need to go to college, and then they they get in the Mercedes that I bought them and say, well, this <laughs> well, is... <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, you've helped your kids out. You've had some success. So if they came to you wanting some capital for some kind of enterprise, of course. you would have that for them? Of course, of course, of course. That's have you done that for any of them yet? Or um... uh, They haven't come up with an idea yet, but I'm waiting. I'm waiting. If my son wanted to open up... We, we talked. If my son wanted to open up his own dojo, uh, we would definitely do that. If my daughter wanted to... To start a clothing line, I'd do that. You know, my wife's friend, uh, all through high school, a uh, yeah, little story here, she was, like, trying to sell handbags off and on. You know, they were in a carpool. She was trying to push her handbags and everything like that. And then that lady is Kate Spade, was Kate Spade. She passed away. But oh. Kate Spade's from Kansas City. But, I mean, that's just to show you how yeah. little things, you can't really, you know, poop poop on anybody's idea because you don't know where that leaves. You don't know what you don't know, right? Amen. So however it happens, it happens. What would you say was the most embarrassing thing that's uh, happened to you on stage? Most embarrassing thing that happened to me on stage? Actually, that's a good question. One time, I uh, I was performing, and my zipper came down. Did you ever have this happen? You don't know it? I was thinking that it was, but it wasn't. Yeah. You know, you know and my zipper came down. I was like, oh, my God. And, you know, of course, I don't notice it, right? The other comic, a comic named Dave Caius, notices this. Hey, your zipper's down. Now, you know... Maybe some people didn't know, right? But once it's shouted from out, it's out there, right? So before I can do anything, it says, I got it. And he hops up on stage and, and pulls my my zipper up. <laughs> I wish somebody had some shots of that because what it looked like, you know, it looked like, like, going, going for it looked like I was getting a mid-show tune-up <laughs> from, a, from a, a fluffer. Fluffer, I'm kind of, I'm back. Can I get a fluffer here? No, no, I'm just bringing it up. Yeah, I'm just bringing it up. And down, and up, and down. Thank you. <laughs> That was the weirdest. It was in St. Louis at a VFW hall. I remember that. What about you? I, I I wouldn't say it was embarrassing, but it was weird. I had a, a girl jump up on stage at the Jacksonville Comedy Zone. I just said goodnight. Mm. And her alcohol just kicked in, and she just got up on stage and mooned the audience, right? Oh, my God. She had a really disgusting. Partial or full? At full on moon, but okay. she had the most disgusting ass. Like uh-huh. It was dark in the middle. Mm-hmm. So everybody, you know what I mean? Mm. It was like, oh! So yeah. the whole people in the audience, you heard them go, Ew! Yeah. You know, it wasn't like a yeah. yeah. It was ew. Yeah. And then she did it, and then she ran out of the room. And I was out there selling merch, and she was just sitting on the chair. I'm like, was that you that just you know mooned everybody on the in the eyes? Like, yeah, she's totally drunk. But um, now I've had a bunch of embarrassing things. I used to have a CD player on stage, and I was changing the disc out, and I had a Coca Cola drop in the thing. It was embarrassing. I couldn't even finish my show. You couldn't do it. I was doing it? music, you know, and I I dump a Coke in my CD player. Anybody ever get on the stage with you? All the time. Who was the famous comic who hit the comic with the guitar? guitar? Yeah. I don't remember his name, but that's... The video is uh, infamous. It's, Kenny it Smith, now. I think. Okay, Kenny something. Yeah. Infamous. That was an infamous clip when I started, man. That was Because the back was then, about. video was, was mm-hmm. rare. I mean, you can catch all those kind of viral moments now, but that was the original one. And it was just back then, it, you had to know somebody that had the tape. Yeah, you no, know, it wasn't out on any. Yeah, no, no, you, you had, had to, to go yeah. find it, some yeah. kind of bootleg of it. Yeah, somewhere. exactly. Oh, don't you remember? That? I mean, those are <laughs> the days we were sending out videotapes to people, VHS, you know, trying to. Get and here's work. the thing about, I mean, back then taping was a big deal, and what happens nowadays with the YouTube and the fact that everybody has it, you can put content out there before you really want it, before you don't know if it's good, before you should or not, before yeah. you should, right? And you can't pull that back i know a lot of comics that put stuff out there and they can't get stuff because it's out there in the ether and it happens you know i've got stuff on me doing tv shows 30 years ago and they book me it's like you don't look that guys like that that shows from 19 evening improv is from 1987 like, mm-hmm. what, what did you think it's, mm-hmm. it's five 25 years later but uh give me your opinion on matt rife don't think he's very good you know i mean i watched his he had a, he I, I was thinking about that when i was telling you that 
I watched his special. You know what I mean? I, everybody told me, all, you know, they all saw his YouTube clips. So I was hearing from all my, my white gay friends and my black women friends. Oh, my God, this matter. But, you know, it's just in little little tidbits, right? And then he finally did the special. And it's like, this is a guy who maybe shouldn't have done that right away. He should have maybe tried to develop his act. Or... Just do what you do best. Just do the do crowd, the crowd work and, and, and get the hell out of there. I right. mean, other people, Harlan Williams, other people have done the crowd rep and get out of there. Don't try to do anything else. And I, Do you think it's given crowd rep a bad name now? No. Because he's kind of been the one that uh, got famous off of crowd work yeah. and then you know did a special and everybody's like, see, this is why if you do crowd work, you're not a real comedian. Yeah, I mean, so he, he, he proved the theory, right? put a shit on it yeah, yeah. somewhat? Yeah, he, he proved the theory there. But... You know what? I, I can't blame He's making a lot of money, and he's going to have to do what he has to do. And maybe he goes back and just tries to uh, not do crowd rap. He's he's at a point in his career now where he can just not do crowd rap and just kind of work on it. And maybe, you know, how you know Richard Pryde and his big comedians, they kind of go back to the club, and they kind of craft what they're going to do. And maybe that's his next step. But, I mean, he's mm-hmm. incredibly good-looking. Basically, you know, he should have just did that and just jumped in the movies, which I'm sure he is. You know, I'm sure he will. I don't know the guy. I've never met the guy. I've never seen his special. Seems like a nice guy. Seems like it is. I, I can't shit on anybody's success in this business. But no. um, when it comes down to, you know, watching everybody else's opinion of it, that's what I'm more interested in watching. I'm more like a casual observer watching everybody else's opinion. Mm-hmm. And I kind of learn from it in a way. But, um, yeah, the Matt Rife thing is, is an interesting thing to me. Somebody told me a long time ago that the cream in, in comedy always rise to the top. You know, talent like cream always rises to the top. Does it, though? I think it does. Okay, well, that's good. I think ones that have the sustainability always stay at the top. Wasn't that what Open Bar does? I mean, you give a chance for a lot of cream to rise to the top. That's what you do, sir. We do that. And we're actually taking those people that have proven themselves over a long period of time to get that opportunity to do it, you know. Um, And that's why, I mean, longevity in this business is a hard thing to attain. Very hard. And um, a lot of people don't really understand the the years of work. I mean, because you're a baby in this business for 10 years. Uh, you're considered a baby in this business Correct. for at least 10 years until, you know, you have some little level of success that's elevated you to a full-time headliner spot or some kind of TV, some kind of podcast uh, that's successful, some kind of thing that's elevating you to but the next But it doesn't, level. you know, last week I worked with a very nice guy, Jake Johansson. You know Jake? Of course. He's a legend. 47 times on Letterman, but it didn't seem to matter. I mean, if somebody said, hey, yeah. I'm going to let you be on Letterman 10 times in your career, I'd be over the yeah. moon. Right. But yeah. Jake Johansson should be a household name after he 47 appearances he on Letterman. Be. And I would, you know, no offense to Jake, but he's known in our circle, but yeah. not a household name. No, but I mean, just as funny as any of these other guys. Without a doubt. Yeah, or, or funnier. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just weird the way that works. And I think what happens also, they says, is once... The show is off; it loses a little bit of its currency, right? Because at least if the show's still running, there's an idea that you could, you know, still do it. But I don't know if that works because the Tonight Show. I mean, is it different now if you did it with Carson, Leno, or Fallon? Does it make a difference? You just say the Tonight Show. I think there's so. different errors, right? Right. I think so um, because I think the legend of Johnny Carson is so big, and and I would have loved to have. Well, let been me ask you this: that. Out of the three errors, Leno. And I'm at four, four. Leno, Carson, Conan, or Fallon. Who would you rather have done it with? Jack Parr. Oh, old school. Old school. I don't believe it. Swish <laughs> from the corner. Hell Jack yeah. Parr. He's a fucking legend. <laughs> See, that's how you know he's been in it a long time. He pulled out the Jack Parr. I was actually just elementary when I did the spinal tap. He went. And- who would you go with? Uh, but it would go, be Johnny Carson. Go, Johnny Carson, of course. Of yeah. course. Maybe because of the connotation back then. You know, I, I saw what it did for Louie and Rosie. Back then there was yeah. a lot of media, so it was yeah. profound what it did for you the very next day. But also saw some people that could win on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson that it didn't do anything. I no. mean, it was supposed to be a shoe-in for success, and it's not for everybody. No. Just like A&E's Evening at the Improv is not, you know, uh, to headlining as, you know, uh, Playboy is to acting. Exactly. That's, a, <laughs> that's an interesting analogy, but yes, I get it. I get it. You know, I you know, I, I don't know how that works. I mean, I think those Tonight Show things are are great. I don't think they have comics on as much anymore. It doesn't mm, seem like yeah. it. You know, yeah. it doesn't seem like, and that's the one thing about Carson is that he always was willing to give up the stage to another comic, right? I mean, who always, mm-hmm. you know, Brenner and all these other people got the co-host and, and they had a comic and it just seems like 
Leno and Letterman, they just stopped using comics as a, as a means to break people into the, the comedy there. And I think even with the Fallon, they kind of shoot all the comics on one night and they just kind of insert them all mm -hmm. post that. I think edit. it was more of a pain in the ass for them because they had to groom guys. You know, yeah. they, they had their talent scouts. They would go out and find the guys that they wanted to give them sets, but then they would groom those guys, if you mm -hmm. remember. They had to submit jokes. They had to change shit I know. Up. I went through all that. And I actually, I, I was supposed to be on the uh, Tonight Show and I had it all set up. We'd gone through about six or seven different edits and uh, I was supposed to go on and... Uh, September of 2001. Ah, oh, shit. Yeah. And uh, Lee, David Lee, all you know, the, the, after the 9/11, the you know they they Nobody stopped doing six. Yeah, they said. And then by the time they started doing comedy again, this is the way show business is. All the people who I had made contacts with were gone. You know what I mean? It was just Son like, of a yeah, bitch. it was just so yeah. But look, that's a very first world problem that I'm upset that I didn't go to the Tonight Show. I mean, I'm sure there's people that are lost family members <laughs> that, are, that are more yeah, concerned about that. Yeah, the scope of things, yeah, uh, yeah. not that big a deal. But in the in reality the of thing, your it, career, It fuck. was a big deal, yes. And yeah, that's a good way to put it. But, uh, <sighs> yeah, no, it was. But I, I, I got to see that little thing. Uh, that's Because mm -hmm. uh, I knew Leno a little bit, and uh, he just called up. And, and I had the blessing. It, what, it was that Leno called up and said, you know, his talent people, and says, start the process. And we went through the sets, and. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I like this. I don't like that. And that was the way it went. But, you know, having done that, would my life be any profoundly different had I done it once? I don't know. Did you have a bit that you were kind of married to and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, they want to change that shit? They cut out a couple ones. I don't I don't remember. I, when I went through my notes and everything like that, I, I saw some drafts and iterations of it and everything like that. But and Were you disappointed that some were missing? That some were taken out? They were cutting out, but I was. they said, take these out and replace it with that. Take these out and replace it with that. And yeah. that's, the, you know, I didn't know they went through that much trouble, but I, I was going to do anything it took to get there, you know. Well, tell me what you wanted to focus on your special tonight. You have free reign of the stage. You can say whatever you want. There's no list. There's no censorship. There's no, there's no list. Nothing. There's no I, there's, language restrictions. There's, there's I can no do anything. There's no restrictions or anything. Tell me about your special. What is the name of it? Uh, the name of my special is uh, Dry Age Well Marbled because yes. I feel that's what I am. I'm a dry age comic. I'm well marbled. I have plenty of comedy flavor even at my thing. And what I wanted to do is just kind of talk about uh, where I am at in life and with my kids. So basically it involves uh, me at my age and adult kids and, and traveling and, and dogs and everything that kind of happens in my life. If you watch comedy, you can see whatever you do your special, it's a snapshot of where you are in life, right. right? So if you were to take a tape of me back 25 years ago, I was talking about changing diaper bits, right? And uh, if you're taking a tape of me now, it's changing my diaper. No, I'm just kidding. It's just uh, it's just a snapshot. It's just something I, wa I wanted to do, and I, I really appreciate the time and, and doing it. I haven't done any TV since, uh, I think, Bob and Tom show. Did you ever do the Bob and Tom show? Yeah. Once. Yeah. So it's since Bob and Tom or the other one. So it's nice to get at least uh, a, a show in every decade just to kind of show your gradual yeah. degradation. You know, the, you know, but just to have something recent, you know, yeah. because... Uh, I look at these specials as historical markers, you know, as, as uh, something that's uh, going to be something that we leave behind, you know. That's an excellent idea. I, I I think about that as you get north of fifty, all that too. You know, all the time. So, yeah, so it's like these young I fuckers. Do, so no they, idea. And this is why you want to make it good. And you want to make it timeless, right? Yes. I mean, timeless, right? You want to make it good. So just like why Seinfeld so popular, it's timeless, right? That's the point, right? Yeah. The situations and the characters aren't. You you could be making a bunch of jokes about whatever uh, is going on right now, and then five years from now, you know. Mm -hmm. Like right now, that I had a lot of good jokes about because I'm from Kansas City, and I live in a neighborhood where Travis Kelsey lives, and he's had a lot of Taylor Swift stuff. I have a lot of jokes about that in the real world, but when this comes out, whenever they could be broken up, it's gone. Right. Leave it. It'll be fleeting. Yeah, it'll be, exactly. It'll be fleeting. Don't do anything about fleeting. Do stuff that's timeless. So that's what I'm I'm trying to do. Hopefully, I'm so glad say. you get that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, I was uh, listening to Eddie Murphy. He was talking about going back and watching Delirious and how it's held up over time. Yeah. And it's because of those exact things. It's the the, the things that we all identify with mm -hmm. and the things that we can all uh, relate to. Yeah. And um, you know, you don't have to be in a specified group to get it. Yeah. So that's I my appreciate goal. you coming out and doing this. You are an amazing comic, and I can't wait to see your Thank special. Thank you. 
Uh, I will tell John well and everybody who said hi back in Kansas City. I hope so. Thank and you. And hopefully, I, if I see Nashville, I'll take his parking space. I'm going to take it. <laughs> Do it. Screw Don't you, man. Don't back out, man. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We'll see you next time on the Open Bar Comedy Show. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.